Okay, hi, my name is Nina Minetti. I'm a staff attorney at Justice at Work, and I work out of the Pittsburgh office. Um, so today we are going to present, be presenting on essential workers' rights during COVID-19. Okay, um, Justice at Work is an organization that provides free legal aid um, and community advocacy um, for low-wage workers, um, particularly low-wage immigrant and migrant workers throughout all of Pennsylvania. We have an office in Pittsburgh and an office in Philadelphia. Um, you can see here some of the legal issues that we cover. Today we're going to be presenting on um, three main topics. The first thing that I'm going to be presenting on is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act and the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act um, and focus a little bit on how that, that um, impacts immigrant workers in particular. Um, then my, my colleague Alia is going to present on the Pennsylvania Departments of Health and Agriculture guidance um, for the safe and the health and safety of, of workers who are still working and um, guidance for employer provided housing. And then Liz is going to present on protections for workers engaging in concerted protected activity. Uh, I just want to say from the start that this presentation is not meant to apply to healthcare workers. There are exceptions written into the, the laws for healthcare workers. And um, for this reason, we're not going to we're not going to cover those type of workers right now. Um, okay, so the Families First Coronavirus Response Act um, applies to leave taken by workers between April first and December thirty first of this year. Um, it, it applies to employers who have less than 500 employees and employers with less than 50, 50 employees may seek an exemption if they're going to be, um, if providing paid leave would threaten the viability of the business. So this exemption is not automatic. Um, they have to apply for it. And we are assuming that the, the the paid sick leave and the paid um, family and medical leave does apply to it to employers with less than 50 employees um, unless they've already received an exemption. DOL and Department of Labor Enforcement of these laws began on April 18th and I'll talk a little bit more about enforcement mechanisms later. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about this as well, but I just want to say for now that, empo that employees who are furloughed or whose work sites are closed are generally not eligible for benefits under these acts. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the, the people who are covered by the emergency paid sick leave. There are two different general categories of coverage under uh, the emergency paid sick leave laws. One category is if you're taking the paid leave for yourself. So if you're taking time off because you're subject to a, a government mandated quarantine or you've been advised by a healthcare provider to quarantine or you are experiencing symptoms of the coronavirus and you're seeking a medical diagnosis, then you can receive either the minimum wage or your regular rate of pay up to $511 per day. And that has a maximum of $5,110 in total over the entire period. Um, just one note that if you're experiencing symptoms of what you believe is the coronavirus and you have to stay home for that reason, you, ca you can't be covered by the paid sick leave if you've just sort of self-diagnosed and unilaterally decided to stay home. You have to be actively seeking a medical diagnosis. The second category um, under which you could receive leave is if you're taking care of another individual. And um, that person either has to be sub subject to a government quarantine 
or advised by a healthcare provider to stay at home. It can also be if your child, your child's school or their, their normal childcare provider is closed or unavailable because of COVID-19. And then there's also a category for any other substantially re related circumstances. However, this, this third final category has not really been fleshed out yet, so it's not clear what that might be. Um, so it's really just the first two categories um, that would be covered as of now. And if you're taking care of another individual, you won't receive your full amount um, in pay. You'll receive two thirds of your normal compensation or $200 per day maximum. And over the entire period, this will be a maximum of 2000 in total. So under the second category that I spoke about, which is when you're caring for another individual, it's um, somewhat of an open question who that individual can be. There's not um, any um, complete definition of exactly who that must be, but this is from the Department of Labor's website where they have a pretty extensive, um, like frequently asked question and answer section for different circumstances. So. As you can see here, the question asks who you can care for and still, still qualify to receive the emergency paid sick leave. Um, and this says that it's someone who genuinely needs your care, someone who's unable to care for him or herself and depends on you for care. Um, caring for this person has to prevent you from working and from teleworking, if that's an option for your job. Um, and you could see the last quote says, your relationship creates an expectation that you would care for the person in a quarantine or self-quarantine situation, and that individual depends on you for care. Um, so these are kind of broad definitions. Um, clearly, there are a lot of different type of people that could fall under this category. And um, it's, again, to some extent, an open question. Who is this second person? And that you could be caring for and what are they going to, you know, it's, they would have to in some way verify that you are caring for someone who genuinely needs your care, which is um, to some extent an open question. So um, for individuals who may be receiving pushback for caring for someone that their employer is saying does not genuinely need their care, um, we would advise them to get in touch with us and um, we can hopefully help with someone in, in this scenario to advocate to their employer that they, um, they can't further inquire into the reasons why you would need to care for someone else. So all employees are eligible for this um, emergency paid sick leave uh, that includes full and part-time employees. So for full-time employees, there's a cap of 80 hours of total sick leave that they can be um, paid for. For part-time employees, there's a cap at two work weeks um, instead of 80 hours. So it's the normal amount that you would work in two work weeks um, that can be paid out in this emergency paid sick leave. This leave is in addition to other leave that may be provided by your employer's policies or by state or local law um, that provides for um, paid sick leave. For example, in the cities of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, there are um, paid sick leave laws. So this would be in addition to those. And employees cannot be required to exhaust their other leave before using the federal emergency leave, or they cannot be required to use it concurrently. Um, so you sh an employee should be able to use this, this uh, emergency paid sick leave um, before having to exhaust any other leave. So the paid sick leave is available to all eligible employees regardless of immigration status, um, but I'm going to talk a, a little more about that in a few minutes. So another provision of the FFCRA is the emergency family and medical leave. Um, so as many of you probably know, existing FMLA provides up to 12 weeks in a 12 month period of unpaid but job protected leave for a variety of family and personal, med personal medical reasons. 
So the emergency family and medical leave expansion provides for paid um, like longer term leave than the sick leave does. Um, so the leave has to exceed 10 days. However, the, the emergency FMLA is only available in the circumstance where you have to um, take leave from work because a child is at home that wouldn't normally be at home. So if their school is closed or if their place of care is closed and it's because of COVID-19 related reasons. So it's a, much, it's a much narrower category than the paid sick leave. Um, so, as I said, it's also a much longer time period. So, after the first um, 10 days of, of leave that you have to take, you can start taking the emergency family and medical leave. But during those first 10 days that would otherwise be unpaid, if you still have the federal emergency sick time available to you, then you can use, you can use the paid sick leave during the first 10 days and then the EFMLA during the next 10 weeks. So in reality, if you haven't used any of that leave time yet, you can use, you'll have 12 weeks of paid leave. Um, however, you're only compensated at two thirds of your um, regular rate of pay. So if you're already taking the, the first 10 days of sick leave to care for a child, where you would be compensated at two thirds of your regular pay, you would take another 10 weeks, also compensated at two thirds of your regular rate of pay. This also has another eligibility requirement, which is that you have to have been on employer's payroll for 30 days prior to the start of your leave. This is also uh, technically available to all eligible employees, regardless of immigration status. But again, I'm going to touch on that in a moment. So there's a cap of 12 paid, 12 weeks of paid leave in total. And um, this, this, is, this is paid leave under the FMLA and under the emergency FMLA expansion. So if your employer was already covered by the FMLA prior to April 1st, and you already used a portion of that 12 weeks in the 12 month period, then that's deducted from the total available to you under the emergency FMLA. Um, in other words, there's 12 weeks total for all types of FMLA use in a 12-month period. However, emergency paid sick leave does not deduct at all from your FMLA leave total. It's, um, it's completely separate. So if you take the paid leave under these emergency um, paid leave acts, then you must be returned to your same position after you take the leave, if it's still available. So you can't be retaliated against for using your leave. Um, your employer cannot fire, discipline, or discriminate against you in any way because, of you, because you take the leave. However, if you were going to be laid off anyway, and you return from leave and your position is not still there for that reason, um, then this is acceptable as long as the employer demonstrates that you would have been laid off anyway. So if a mass furlough or layoff happens while you're on leave and the position is no longer available for you to come back to, then the employer is not required. Um, there are also some exceptions for key employees and for employer, employees at businesses with fewer than 25 employees, but um, they're narrow exceptions and um, they're written about more um, below at this link, which, which again goes to the Department of Labor FAQs, which are helpful for addressing different scenarios. So to report violations of either of these paid leave provisions, um, you can report them to the Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division. They started enforcing on um, April 17th. Um, however, there's also a private right of action for the emergency paid sick leave um, an employee can file a lawsuit against the employer directly without having to contact the wage and hour division first. And for the FMLA, an employee can file a lawsuit directly, but only if the employer employs more than 50 people. Uh, 
Um, so one big question about uh, the the paid the paid leave is what type of documentation your employee employer can require for you to be able to take your leave. Um, so you can see here there's a list of the DOL's rules um, requirements for what you have to provide. Uh, however, there's been pushback against the DOL for adding additional requirements to what the act provided, which narrows who can who can be eligible for leave so much that they say that it's um, it's contrary to the the reason for the for the laws. So there's a currently a lawsuit um, the state of New York against the United States Department of Labor. Um, and they're challenging the DOL's final rule that adds these additional requirements. Um, and again, I would suggest that if, if an employer is, is requiring more documentation or requiring um, specific documentation that um, your employee doesn't, isn't, they're not available or um, they can't provide for some reason, this is another situation where it'd be a good idea to refer um, a client to Justice at Work because um, we'll be working on cases like this. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the immigration status and eligibility requirements. So, as I said, um, technically the people of all immigration statuses are eligible um, for these paid leave provisions. However, the reality is that the way that people are going to be paid is directly from their employers. So if someone takes paid sick leave, they're going to continue to be paid as they normally would from their employers. And then the employer can turn around later and ask for reimbursement from the federal government in the form of a tax credit, which the employer will then have to f fill out certain documentation <laughs> to be able to receive this um, money for reimbursing them. Um, so for, for individuals that may be undocumented and may be being paid um, in cash under the table, um, there could be pushback from employers um, because they may not be able to provide the, the type of documentation for them to, be, to receive a reimbursement. Um, so although people of all immigration statuses are eligible, um, they could still receive pushback from employers. And again, this is a going to be um, a bit of a difficult situation and we would just recommend that someone calls justice at work because we'll also be working on cases like this. And we can provide um, more advice given people's individual circumstances. Okay, I'm going to turn over now to my co colleague Alia to talk about health and safety in the workplace and housing. Hi everyone, I'm Alia al -Khatib. I'm a staff attorney with Justice at Work in the Philadelphia office. Thanks Nina. Um, so there are some questions in the chat um, and we were just going to address the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, Sorry if I created any confusion, uh, but hopefully Nina can review some of the questions about uh, that section and we'll address it all at the end once we get through the rest of the, the presentation. So my portion is going to focus on health and safety in the workplace and also in housing and employer provided housing. Justice at Work works a lot with seasonal farm workers who come to Pennsylvania during, during the season and um, from like April to November roughly and there are certain provisions related to employer provided housing that are particularly relevant um, and some orders that came out from the Department of Agriculture in Pennsylvania that I'll be discussing. Can you go to the next slide? So first just a quick overview. Um, all workers have a right to a safe and healthy workplace under the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Pennsylvania is subject only to federal OSHA. There's no state OSHA agency, no, no equivalent to the federal OSHA agency. Some states are called state plan states and they have their own OSHA agency. Pennsylvania is not one of those states. So we rely on federal OSHA to enforce workplace health and safety. 
I'll be talking a little bit later about the process for filing a complaint with OSHA uh, and some of the limitations with that. But first, I wanted to get into some of the Pennsylvania specific orders for essential workers. Can you go to the next slide? So on April 15th, the Department of Health in Pennsylvania issued an order related to employers um, of employees working in essential businesses. And it outlined some of the measures that employers must take to make sure that its workforce is healthy and safe. We have a link to the order on that slide. So some of those measures include extra cleaning and disinfecting in accordance with CDC guidelines. Also, if a business finds out that someone has been exposed to an individual who's sick with COVID, then that business must close off the area where the sick employee has been working and ventilate it for at least 24 hours before beginning to clean it. It must identify employees who are in close contact with that individual. It also must test employees' temperatures when they begin their shifts and send any employees who display symptoms uh, to go home uh, and stay home from work. Additionally, employers should try to stagger employees' schedules. So that means changing the start and end time so people aren't uh, coming in in groups and especially clocking in in groups and clocking out in groups. It also means staggering employee break time so they're not all taking breaks in groups. It also talks about maintaining social distancing even at work. That includes times for taking breaks and meals and requiring workers to stay at least six feet apart from each other. Also limiting the number of employees in common areas and making sure that meetings are either virtual or if meetings must be held in person, there's a limit to 10 people and those, those workers are maintaining at least six feet of distance between each other. Additionally, the employer must also provide employees access to frequent hand washing with soap and water. Uh, if that's unavailable, hand sanitizer. And employers must be providing protective masks to employees to be worn at all times. For those businesses that are open to the public, those businesses, essential businesses can require customers to wear masks as well. There are some limited exceptions to that for businesses that provide medications and for customers who can't wear masks for various reasons, um, but those exceptions are noted in the order. Businesses also op open to the public should install shields and barriers in checkout areas to separate cashiers and customers and limit customers and employees in the building at one time. So the next slide um, has to do with uh, an order or guidance that was issued by the Department of Agriculture, specifically related to seasonal farm workers. I'm gonna highlight a bit more the provisions related to employer-provided housing. And this has to do with employers who provide seasonal farm labor housing and the specific steps that they have to take to make sure that their employees are kept safe while in employer-provided housing. So first, workers must be provided housing, including dorms, hotel rooms, or other types of housing that is safe and minimizes the spread of COVID. Some of the recommendations in the guidance include keeping beds at least six feet apart and arranged in a way that workers sleep head to toe. Also providing cloth face masks to workers while they're in their housing, making sure that there's appropriate ventilation and windows are open so that um, the housing areas are ventilated and also providing hand washing facilities and soap and water and hand sanitizer if that's not available. The guidance from the Department of Agriculture also talks about a plan that employers who house seasonal farm workers must have uh, for quarantine housing. So if a worker or workers show symptoms of COVID, employers must provide separate sleeping, cooking, and bathing facilities for those quarantine workers. They must provide personal protective equipment, like masks for those workers who display symptoms of COVID and make sure that those quarantine workers also have access to food, supplies, and transportation for medical care. The employer also should identify and alert other workers who've been exposed and make sure that um, the housing is cleaned very thoroughly if a worker is confirmed to have had COVID. In terms of the worksite requirements, the Department of Agriculture guidance 
uh, says that the order from the Secretary of Health that was issued on April 15th also applies to seasonal farm workers. So all of that guidance that I reviewed um, at the beginning applies also for se seasonal farm work. So they must allow for hand washing at the work sites, uh, also maintain social distancing, provide face masks, and educate seasonal farm workers about how to safely use face masks and, and how to follow those measures to protect from the spread of the virus. So those workers, I just want to mention one more thing um, on the previous slide that um, they also, employers have to provide clean and sanitary housing. So they have to make sure that high contact areas are routinely cleaned and sanitized. And because these employees are working in employer provided housing, they're often transported to and from the work sites in groups together. So employers should really limit the number of workers transported at one time and try to keep six feet of distance uh, between the workers, even when they're transporting them to and from work sites. So that was all the Pennsylvania specific guidance that has come out, um, and that's very helpful. There is a question of enforceability of that guidance. Certainly, we would say that employers should be should be following that, and it should be a requirement. The guidance and the orders do not sort of outline mechanisms for enforcement. So I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, one potential avenue through OSHA, and then Liz later is also going to be talking about concerted protected activity for workers who are exposed to unsafe workplaces. So OSHA has issued guidance that's industry specific. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, some of the articles about the meatpacking industry and some of the outbreaks in the meatpacking industry in Pennsylvania and, and throughout the country. So this week, CDC and OSHA issued joint guidance about the meatpacking industry specifically. And we have a link there to the guidance that was issued. They also issued guidance for other industries like the construction industry and the manufacturing industry. So we included a link to that industry specific guidance. And it should be noted that the link also contains translations to Spanish. If you have uh, workers who are asking about that, you can provide that to them. So the next slide talks briefly about OSHA complaints. So that is one mechanism that workers who are exposed to unsafe working conditions, for example, if an employer isn't providing PPE, isn't maintaining social distancing, they are able to file a complaint with OSHA in Pennsylvania. Um, and the complaint process is fairly easy. Uh, a worker can do it with, with an advocate or attorney, either by phone, by fax, or even online. And one of the benefits is that a worker can also file anonymously. It has to be a worker who currently works there. If they don't work there, and if they, uh, for, some, for some reason, have a claim of retaliation, if, if they complained about working conditions and then were retaliated against, they can file a claim for retaliation under Section 11C, and that must be filed within 30 days. So that's a pretty quick turnaround if a worker has been retaliated against. Employers are not allowed to retaliate against workers who complain about workplace safety. Uh, however, it does if it does happen, they do have a remedy under Section 11C. OSHA has other whistleblower protections specific to different industries, and they actually have different statute of limitations depending on the industry. So I just included a link there to OSHA whistleblower protections. One thing that I really should note uh, related to OSHA is that there are a lot of issues with enforcement, unfortunately. OSHA is a very under-resourced agency. As I mentioned early on, Pennsylvania does not have its own state equivalent, so we're relying on federal OSHA that is very under-resourced. And there is no private right of action under OSHA. So you can file a complaint. In the normal course of events when there's no pandemic and people aren't working from home, OSHA conducts spontaneous on-site visits and they inspect for safety, uh, in the workplace after a complaint has been made and fine employers who have any sort of safety violations. During this time, unfortunately, we've heard that OSHA is not conducting any on-site visits and that they are following up on complaints by phone, which certainly is not as effective, I would think. Um, so it's still an option and we certainly would encourage workers to file OSHA complaints. Uh, but Liz is going to talk about concerted protective activity uh, and the NRLA, which provides a, 
a few other remedies for workers. Excuse me, if I could just interrupt quickly. This is Kelly, and for the attorneys on the webinar right now, I have just launched a poll. Um, the box should pop up on your screen. Please respond yes or no to the question. And um, again, this is for the CLE credit. You will have to answer two questions. This is the first of two. And thank you. You could go back to the presentation. Sorry for the interruption. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Liz Chaco, and I'm an attorney and deputy director at Justice at Work. I work out of our Philadelphia office. Um, just wanted to wish everyone a happy International Workers' Day. And um, I'm going to be speaking about concerted protected activity and uh, more generally, and then we'll spend a few minutes speaking about these protections and how they apply to essential workers. So um, I want to cover, this is what I'd like to cover today, is um, first talk about who is protected and then what actions are protected and um, remedies that are available. So um, to workers when, they're, when their rights are violated. Uh, next slide, please. So the National Labor Relations Act is the federal kind of New Deal era law that was established um, in 1935 to protect workers who wish to organize into unions or to engage in other concerted activity for the mutual benefit of workers. So um, it affords protections to most employees at private employers, but excludes from its protections federal, state, and local government employers. Um, but in 1937, a couple of years later, Pennsylvania established the Pennsylvania Labor Relations Act, which fills in some of the gaps. Um, in the NLRA, notably uh, coverage of state, local, and county employees. Um, so these laws govern how workers can form unions and how unions and management bargain with each other, but I'm not gonna be speaking about unions or protections for unionized workers. Um, so instead today, we'll be talking exclusively about protections <clears throat> for non-unionized employees. Um, the NLRA is enforced by the National Labor Relations Board and the PLRA by the Pennsylvania Labor Relations Board. The membership of the boards is by um, political appointment and workers can bring complaints, uh, which are known as charges, uh, to the boards, which then investigate the charges and um, make findings or determinations. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have um, a picture of um, some workers engaging in concerted protected activity. Um, not every worker is protected by state and federal labor laws. Um, on the left um, here of the slide, you see striking California farm workers from the 1960s, and on the right is an image of West Virginia teachers striking more recently. Um, only one of these groups of workers would be protected if they engaged in this type of activity in, in the state of Pennsylvania. So um, it's probably a little bit easier to speak about who is not protected by uh, the NLRA and the PLRA because um, most employees are covered. Um, as you can see, some of the most vulnerable workers are excluded. So agricultural employees and domestic workers are not covered by the National Labor Relations Act or the uh, Pennsylvania um, equivalent. Um, government employees are also excluded, as I mentioned, and supervisors and independent contractors are also excluded from the NLRA protections. Um, supervisors are generally defined as those people who use independent judgment to make or recommend personnel decisions such as hiring or firing. Um, and managerial employees are defined as people who make, execute, or exercise independent judgment about management policies. So the National Labor Relations Act, I mean, the, sorry, the Pennsylvania Labor Relations Act um, uh, contains most of the same exclusions as the NLRA, but it, um, does protect certain employees excluded from the National Act, such as state and local employees and um, horticultural employees. So we at Justice at Work have a history of representing workers um, before the PLRB because um, mushroom workers are covered by the Act. And um, for those of you who don't know, Pennsylvania is um, produces um, a very high percentage of mushrooms that the country consumes. Um, so litigation that we brought in the 1990s helped clearly establish the rights of mushroom workers under the Pennsylvania Labor Relations Act. Uh, um, but 
I would say that other than our clients, most of the work done before the board it involves public employees rather than employees of private businesses. So let's talk about what actions are protected. Um, the two statutes define protected activity slightly differently, but I'm going to focus on the, um, the NLRA's de definition. Um, so Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act states, among other things, that employees have a right to engage in concerted activities for the purpose of mutual aid or protection. So what does this mean? Um, so concerted, let's start with that, means um, activity that is um, engaged in, with, or on the authority of other employees and not solely by one employee. Um, an employee's use of the word we in and of itself doesn't establish that that person is expressing a group concern, but an employee can be found to speak on behalf of other workers, even if that individual is not specifically um, authorized or designated as a spokesperson of, um, of a group of employees. Um, concerted activity can also be found when individuals bring a group complaint to the attention of management. Um, and to reach such a finding, there has to be a, some kind of evidence of prior or contemporaneous discussion of the concern between um, members of the workforce. And um, finally, I guess I would say that concerted activity may be found where there's one single employee who communicates with another employee with the object of initiating or um, preparing for group action in the interest of employees. Um, and so, but this, act, but this discussion can't be simply um, griping or um, complaining. It has to uh, be kind of conversations or talk looking toward group action. So looking at, um, oh, can we just go back to the previous slide? Um, so we talked about what concerted means in the, in the uh, context of concerted protected activity, um, but the action must also be for mutual aid or protection. Um, and that just means that um, the activity must be for the mutual benefit of the employees. And um, it should involve matters that are within the control of the employer. So for example, um, restaurant workers, if they're complaining about a customer's, customer's tipping habits, um, that's not really within the control of the employer. Um, and it, they must, the, the, the demands or complaints must be um, aimed at changing the employer's policies or practices, and they can't just be kind of um, complaints that are um, more aimless. So um, Section 8 of the National Labor Relations Act, um, oh, let's go back to the previous one, I'm sorry, Nina, <laughs> um, talks about prohibited activities by, uh, or prohibited actions by employers, employees, and unions, and these are known as unfair labor practices. Um, so this here is a list, but it's not a comprehensive list of unfair labor practices, but um, I've included just kind of the more relevant um, types of unfair labor practices. So as you can see, um, it's an unfair labor practice for employers to interfere with workers who are engaging in concerted protected activity. Um, so um, workers, um, employers can't um, you know, try to offer incentives to workers to not talk to each other or not post um, information um, online that's part of a concerted protective activity. Um, and it's also an unfair labor practice for employers to discriminate or retaliate against workers who engage in um, concerted protected activity or who file charges with the board or who testify before the board. Um, so, but the actions that aren't protected, um, uh, so if actions are violent or unlawful or in breach of contract um, or uh, otherwise indefensible, they're not protected. Um, but the demands, um, in, they really, um, protected activity um, can take a lot of different forms. So um, there can be demands in writing or verbal demands for improved working conditions or relating to the terms of work. Um, conversations that workers have in person or or even online are considered protected as long as the workers are talking about terms and conditions of employment. So those that can include things like wages, benefits, um, working conditions, safety, um, workplace culture. So um, yeah, like I mentioned, concerted protected activity can take place online, but it, again, remember it must be concerted. So if a single worker makes a rant on their Facebook page about their employer, that 
uh, may not be protected. So um, work stoppages um, are also um, can be protected. So there is protected work stoppages and unprotected work stoppages. Um, Non-unionized employees generally have a right to, to walk out or otherwise stop work as a form of protesting the terms and conditions of their employment. Um, however, intermittent work stoppages or pattern of work stoppages are not protected if they're relating to the same concern or demand. Um, and likewise, slowdown, stri slowdown strikes, which is when um, employees withhold some portion of uh, their labor while at work are also consider considered unprotected. So let's talk about um, more specifically about um, workers who are taking collective action to protest unsafe or unhealthy working conditions. Um, so these types of actions are generally protected. Um, um, the Tamara Foods case, which is cited here, and that was the general kind of holding of that case. Um, but what if you have a worker um, or an employer who says that they've taken lots of safety measures? Um, even if that's the case, uh, workers' collective action is, can still be protected. Um, and additionally, the fact that the workplace might have been deemed safe by a government agency like OSHA, for example, it's not sufficient to make employees' conduct unprotected. So, um, for example, workers can um, in, go on strike or engage in a work uh, stoppage, even if the employer is saying that they've taken a bunch of safety measures and have had the building cleaned or whatever. Um, the, the concerted activity can still be con considered protected. Um, in this Tamara Foods case, the NLRB held that employees are not required to demand that their employer take any specific actions to address their concerns in order for their um, concerted, protected, concerted conduct to be um, about workplace safety to be found protected. So employees, you know, they don't have to make specific demands about safety issues before they strike. And what if, um, oh, sorry, just go back to the last slide for a second. What if workers, what if, um, you know, you have a client who just really feels uncomfortable going to work and feels that the workplace is, um, is genuinely unsafe because of um, what's happening with other workers or the employer's um, safety protocol. So employees can refuse to go to work, um, you know, if they're engaging with other employees in a concerted manner, if they have a reasonable and good faith belief that working under certain conditions would not be safe. The NLRA protects employees if they're honestly mistaken, so that's important to note um, that even if, if employees are mistaken about you know, um, how, how safe or not safe it is in the workplace, if they have an honest, good faith um, belief, their actions are protected. So we've heard from workers who are making demands um, that they may not be entitled, that they might not be entitled to under the new COVID related laws that like um, um, Alia and uh, Nina were speaking about earlier. Like, um, you know, they may, for example, be working at an employer that's um, exempt from the laws because it's a large employer. Um, you might've heard in the news today about a coalition of employees across the country, like Target, Walmart, Whole Foods employees um, who are um, walking off their jobs today in a protest about unsafe working conditions and they made a, they're making a variety of demands, um, like for hazard pay or um, increased PPE at work, um, and increased transparency from companies about like COVID cases in the workplace. And, and that's protected activity. And um, it doesn't matter if those are not uh, demands that, if those things are demanding or not things that they're legally entitled to under the existing laws. Um, and some other protected activities that we've been seeing recently are um, in addition to strikes and walkouts are um, social media com campaigns, um, pe workers speaking to the press about work conditions in a group, um, doing kind of other public facing protests like Honkins, um, and uh, also just speaking with each other about um, concerns with other employees about concerns in the workplace um, and bringing those demands to um, managers um, either in person at the work site or um, you know, through email. So let me just talk quickly about 
what remedies are available for violations of the um, National Labor Relations Act. Um, so workers who have experienced a violation and file a charge with the board in a timely way are entitled, um, if, there's a, if there's a determination of a violation, um, they're entitled to back pay. So um, you know, if they were retaliated against by being fired unlawfully, they're entitled to pay from the date of that they were fired. Um, they're entitled to reinstatement. There are some other remedies that include like postings at the works at the work site. Um, remedies can be limited for undocumented workers, unfortunately, because of um, Supreme Court decision um, from about 20 years ago, Hoffman Plastics. Um, so if a worker is undocumented, they may not be able to collect the same remedies. Um, and then I also just want to note that um, there are pretty short statute of limitations for filing. The um, NLRA has a six month uh, statute of limitations and the PLRA has a very short six week um, uh, limitation on filing. Um, and one last thing I just wanted to note is that um, the NLRA charges can be brought by any individual. So um, they don't have to be filed by an individual, by a worker. Um, so, you know, we've heard concerns from workers about um, retaliation um, if they file something with the board. So that's just something to note. Um, you know, workers' identities will probably at some point be made known to the employer because workers who file it, um, if you file a charge on behalf of workers, they will be interviewed by the board. Um, and the employer will obviously have to notify the company if there's a back pay award that needs to be made. But um, it's something to keep in mind if you're dealing with workers who have some um, fears about retaliation. So that's um, all I wanted to say about concerted protected activity. Um, we're gonna go to questions in a minute, but I just wanted to um, make a note about um, kind of you know, workplace exploitation generally. You know, we, we know that um, during times of crisis, there is an increase in extreme exploitation of workers and in human trafficking. So this happened you know, during, um, in, the, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, there were a lot of human trafficking cases that came out of that. Um, and we unfortunately anticipate that that will again happen during the current crisis. So um, we just encourage you to have people call us if, you, if, if you're talking to, to someone who's experiencing workplace exploitation in Pennsylvania, they can call us or they can call the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And the number for, uh, for the hotline is up here. Um, this is how you or potential clients can reach us. We're um, um, operating on a regular schedule from nine to five. You can call our number. Um, we, our intake hasn't stopped um, at all uh, since, since we went to work, uh, remote work. Um, and I think we're going to turn to questions. Okay. Anybody that has questions, please type them in the chat box feature. For attorneys requesting CLE credit for your participation, I am launching the second of the um, poll box questions. Please respond either yes or no to uh, receive credit for your participation in this webinar. And this will stay up for one minute. In the meantime, please send any questions you have in the chat box so they can be addressed. So, You're welcome to go ahead with questions. Um, so let's see. Um, so there's a question um, that maybe Alia can address about if an employer must clean and sanitize workspaces or whether the employer can require employees to keep workspaces clean. Um, or is this a requirement placed solely upon the employer? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure the language of the order does seem to place it on the employer, but certainly the employer may then delegate to the employees. I think um, if if an employee is required to um, clean clean their workspace, then certainly they should be getting paid for that time, and that shouldn't be docked from their time in any way. But I'm not actually sure. Um, it's not totally clear on the order if an employer can make an employee do it or if they have to do it themselves. I think um, our position would just be it is ultimately the employer's responsibility. 
So there's a question um, about enforcing the, uh, the um, Pennsylvania guidance or um, protocol with the Department of Health, Health, and has anyone in the group tried to enforce the, um, with, via the Pennsylvania Department of Health? So I can just say from our, from from Justice at Work, we we haven't yet. We've um, been in communication with the Department of Health, um, and we've considered that, Marielle, and maybe we can talk offline about uh, joint efforts. Um, okay, so there's a question from um, Daniel about representing workers in an NLB process and litigation. How long do these processes normally take from the date of the complaint to the worker receiving back pay. Um, so in, in our experience um, with the NLRB, their process is actually pretty quick. Um, one thing I guess I should just say about the NLRB is that um, we're operating under a Republican NLRB and um, you know that may change some things, although we actually haven't seen much of a change out of the Philadelphia NLRB office in our um, practice. And um, you know, I think we generally get a call from an NLRB agent within 48 hours of filing a charge. Um, and they would they usually would like to speak with our client to do an interview within a few days. Um, you know, sometimes um, in terms of how long it, it takes for the process to wrap up, I think it depends on a lot of factors, like how many workers are in, are affected, how, how big the employer is, how much pushback the employer is getting, and terms of contesting what the allegations are and if the employer is willing to um, to settle, which is how a lot of our cases before the board have, have been resolved. Um, they just make a settlement, which our clients are generally willing to take. Um, I just want to clarify something based on the first question that's in the chat um, about the exemption um, for businesses with 50, uh, fewer than 50 employees. So I'm um, sorry for not clarifying this earlier. So that exemption can only apply for the, the, um, the leave taken for childcare um, as the as the question, the, some of the, the conversation says. So for businesses with less than employ, 50 employees, they can apply for an exemption um, from paying the, the leave taken for childcare purposes only. Are there any other questions? Oh, if we're not seeing any other new questions, um, I would want to thank our presenters for presenting all this wonderful information. For anyone that joined late, we will be emailing out um, a copy of the PowerPoint and a few other handouts that will be helpful for you. And we thank you for joining us and wish you a great weekend. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Take care, everyone.